Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege that you give us to come and study your word together. We know you have a good purpose for bringing us together. We're praying for everyone here, brother and sister, that your purpose will be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. As we are taking us through a series on the family, we pray, O oh Lord, you touch every family in Jesus' name. Where there are problems, we pray that you bring solutions. Where there are heartaches and headaches in the families, we pray, O oh Lord, you bring your divine touch and turn everything around for the positive in Jesus' name. And we pray that families that are doing well will do better. In Jesus' name, we pray. At this time, as you have noticed, and if you came last week, we're going through a series on the family. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. And it talks about the wife and about the husband. And we're taking that opportunity not to limit ourselves to just these verses alone, but to go through the scriptures and see what the Lord is saying about the family. I want to say that if you have questions on the family, getting married, after the marriage, raising children, or whatever problems you want solved in the family, you can write it in question form and then turn it over in your district and then your coordinators will see how to get it to the central church. And as we go through, then we'll see how to address those problems so that while we're on this series, the Lord will help us to see how to bring solution to our problems. Today we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Those two verses reveal a situation in a family. There you have the mention of the wives and the mention of the husbands. And he's talking about wives that believe. Because he talks about such a wife being subjection. And that also, if those husbands have not believed, you by your conversation, by your character, by your conduct, you may win them to the Lord. That talks then of a believing, a born again wife. And this is talking about husbands that have not believed. It says, if any of those husbands obey not the word. Which means the unbelieving husbands, sinful husbands, carnal husbands. And that's what we're looking at today, the Christian wife and her unbelieving husband. And sometimes it happens like that, that you have a wife that believes and the husband that does not believe. A wife that has the mark of Christianity or the mark of Christ living within her, in her life, living with her husband that do not know the Lord in any way. If such a problem in the family may arise in two ways. Number one, it may be that they got married before they both, uh, before they knew Christ at all. They married as unbelievers. And then the gospel came to the wife or came to both of them. And then the wife, being tender in heart and believing on the Lord, yielded herself to the Lord, became a believer and the husband is still an unbeliever. Or it may be on the other hand, they married as believers. The husband was a Christian, the wife was a Christian, they married even in the church, and eventually the husband, because of the cares of this life, because of running after the things of the world, or because of the pressure in the place of work, or because of the temptations and trials coming from his extended family, or because of the influence of people around him, he backslid no more in the Lord, but the wife is still in the Lord. And in such cases, there will be conflict at home because uh, they have a different focus, because they have different goals, and because they have different motivation. One has grace, the other one is graceless. While the wife is trying to go the way of heaven and pulling up, the husband is going the opposite direction and pulling down, there will be conflict because of those differences and it will, they will, it will appear in the home and that conflict will result into problems or persecution or whatever it is that the wife now, the uppermost in her heart, will be the conversion of the husband. And the Lord is giving us these two verses by the Spirit of God through Peter so that these kinds of problems can be solved in our families. In these two verses, we're looking at three points. Number one, the character of an unbelieving husband. Number two, the conduct of a submissive Christian wife. Number three is the conversion of the husband through the wife. 
And uh, if you will follow the study and pray for the Lord to write these things upon the tables of your heart and give you all the needed grace to go and practice at home what you are hearing here. Before long, we'll be hearing testimonies from your families. Look at it now, point number one, the character of an unbelieving husband. It's in the middle of verse one. Let me read it from the beginning. Likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word. It's talking about husbands that do not obey the word. First of all, there is a general obedience to the word of God. And this husband does not have that general obedience to the word of God. Number two, there is a particular obedience to the word as it is related to the family. That the Lord instituted the family. And he tells us, number one, that it is for that the family marriage is for partnership. And if this man were obeying the word, he will stay at home. He will share with the wife. There will be partnership, companionship. There will be friendship, there will be fellowship. But this man lives an isolated life and the wife is lonely because the man is not obedient to the world. Number two, the word of God tells us marriage is for purity. This man is not obedient to the world. He misbehaves, he's unfaithful to the wife. Number three, marriage is for provision. This man is not providing for the family. And the Bible says the husband must provide, he's the head of the home. And the wife is always looking up to this man. The purpose of this marriage, of this union, is for provision. He is not obedient to the world. And the marriage is for protection. That this man, as the husband of the woman and the father of the home, will protect the family. This man is not protecting the wife in any way. In the physical, will not protect her from hunger, will not protect her from all the uh, vicissitudes of life, will not protect her from the in-laws, exposes her to danger in the community and danger in the village. And you see, marriage is also preserved. It is to be for life till death do us part. No one shall put them asunder. The man is not obeying the word. He's already looking out. He's already wanting to divorce the wife, push away the wife, and have another. This is a man that obeys not the word. And then his character, there will be a lot of things in his character that will show the wife that this man, he might be coming to church, he might be hearing the gospel, he might even be reading the Bible at home, he might be religious, but he's not obedient to the word of God. What are the characteristics, the behavior, the conduct of the people that do not obey the world? In 1 Samuel chapter 25, we're reading there in verse 17. And as we're looking at the word of God, you'll be looking at what needs change, transformation in your life. Uh, the word of God is not coming to us to condemn us or crucify us. It's to show us before the mirror so that we can see what is dirty, what is not all right in our lives. And after seeing the mirror of the word of God, we'll go back to God and say, God, I am the man. I am the husband. I am not totally obedient to the word. And my wife is suffering as a result of that. And the blood of Jesus will wash us. And the power of the Lord will transform our lives. In transforming our lives, our families will be transformed. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 17. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master. That's the man, the husband of this woman they are talking to. you, And against all his household. Listen to this now. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Here is an husband that nobody will be able to talk to. The frown on the face, the look on the face, the attitude, the characteristic. It's like, don't come near. If you come near, fire will burn. They position themselves in such a way that their wives will not be able to talk. They build a fence around them that the wife will not be able to come into that circle. They want their wives and children at home. If you tell anybody and they come to me, they say they want to counsel me, I will know you are the one that let out the cat outside the cage. I'll deal with you. There are such people that nobody can talk to them. And the people that want to come and talk to you, they want to bless you. They want to help you. They want to turn you in the right direction. They want you to have a happy life and a happy family. And you so position yourself, nobody can talk to you. A friend 
friends in the church cannot talk to you and friends anywhere cannot talk to you and things are going down. Your life, your marriage is going down the drain and God is sending angels. God is sending his ministers that they will talk to you so that your marriage will not collapse and your life will not perish and you position yourself in such a way that nobody can talk to you. In verse 36, and Abigail came to Nabal. Abigail is a, was a wife. Nabal was the husband. And behold, he held the feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within, and he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. Here is the characteristic of the unbelieving husband. There is problem at home. There is problem, the determination of David, the king, to deal with the man and kill him. The problem was there, but he drowned himself in drunkenness. Fire is burning in the house. Instead of addressing the problem, instead of praying about the problem, he goes out to make merriment with other people, or it is in his own house, he makes merriment, and he is drunken. Instead of facing the realities of life. In Second Chronicles chapter 22, as we're looking at all these, you'll be measuring it by your own family. In Second Chronicles 22, verses 3 and 4, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. And I told you that these husbands, they do not obey the word. The Bible says, for this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two of them shall be one flesh. This man, instead of a being with the wife, joined with the wife, cleaving to the wife, reasoning with the wife, planning with the wife, deciding with the wife, counseling will be coming from the mother, and the mother is unbelieving. It's the character of an unbelieving husband. When it happens that the secrets of his life, the wife does not know where he's walking, what he's planning, what his dreams are, what his goals are, the wife does not know. Outsiders know more about that husband than the wife at home. As we are talking about the husband, if the wife is unbelieving, it's the same character of an unbelieving wife. That the husband will not know the details about her. It's her mother that they will plan everything and decide everything. All that the mother plans and decides with her is what she will do. The word of the believing husband at home does not carry weight. In verse 4 it says, Wherefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab. In the Old Testament, when they wanted to compare somebody with a good person, they will say like David. When they wanted to compare somebody with the most wicked fellow, they will compare him with Ahab. But it says in the latter part of that verse 4, For they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. And these unbelieving husbands, some believing men, they will not know that the advice and the counseling they are getting from outside is for their destruction, is to ruin their business and to take all the money they have. All the capital they have sometimes, they want to put into a business instead of praying with the wife, instead of staying with the wife, planning everything and uh, looking at the direction they must go, the advice will be coming from outside. The wife will not know anything until the whole capital is drowned in, the, uh, in all the debt. Uh, they will not know anything because the man has been hiding it from the wife. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, later you read it yourself. We don't have the time to read all the verses from verses 2 to 9. This man married uh, Anna, a, a good wife. And he himself testified that am I not better to you than ten sons? They loved one another. This was a good woman, a prayerful woman. But because of delay in having a child, he went for the second woman. It's a character of the unbeliever. It's a character of the people that do not know the Lord, that are not obedient to the word because of a little medical problem in the wife. Because there is no child yet, they run out of penina. But don't you know, delay does not mean denial. That Anna did not have a child at that time did not mean she will never have a child. All the children that Penina got his second wife, do you know their names? Where is their record in the word of God? It's not just to have children, children that count, children that are important, children that are significant. And then Anna, at, in God's own time, at Samuel. We know about Samuel. We know what he did. We know he was a blessing to the whole nation. If you have a wife, and the wife has not got a child yet, that doesn't mean you are going to abandon her. And then look for a second wife. It's the way of the unbelieving man. In Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. 
Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. Yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. That is, the wife that you first married, you never knew any woman before. This was your first wife when you were still young. And when she was young, you married her, the wife of your youth. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion, the wife of thy covenant. You know, some believing husbands, sometimes it's a maid in the house that they will now they'll be going to and talking uh, uh, fine into the night, and there'll be no fellowship between them and their wives. It's only the maid. It's the maid that knows about the cooking, about his life, about where he's traveling to, about what he's planning. And the wife is now like a stranger in the family. It's the way of the unbelieving man. But then, that should not make the wife to backslide. Two wrongs will not make a right. If the man is going astray, the woman should not say, okay, because you are going astray, I too, I will go astray. The fact that the grace of God is in the life of the woman is still bringing the presence of God and the power of God and great possibilities into that family. So, Christian woman, don't get discouraged and don't say, he's done that for me. I too, I will go out. I will show him that that thing is painful. He will know how painful it is. No, you can't do that. He has backsliding or he is an unbeliever. You remain a Christian so the power of God can walk in your family. That leads us to point number two. In 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Likewise, see wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Christian sisters, underline the word own. O-W-N. Your own husband. You should so identify your husband, locate your husband, respect your husband, and make your husband a special person. He has a special place in your life. He is your own husband. He takes a place in your life that no man anywhere in the world, past, present, or future, will ever be able to take in your life. As people refer to my car, my house, my land, my certificate, my job, just mine, and they take possession of it, and they are proud of it. I'm using the word proud in a good way. You look at your husband, even though he has not believed now, he can still believe. He will still believe. He will know the Lord. You will know. This is my husband. Whatever his life is now, this is my own husband. Grace will touch him. The power of God will touch him. And with your prayer, with your respect, with everything the Lord wants you to do, a change of time will come and a change of life will come. The brothers in the church will not be the substitute for your husband because your husband is not coming to church, because your husband is not obeying the gospel, because your husband is not behaving well at home, because your husband is not making it easy and convenient for you. Then you have substitutes. You have this brother now. You'll be sharing with the brother. It's like that brother has become a substitute. It should not be so. Your own husband. If that is so for the people that have unbelieving husbands, how much more for those who are so lucky, those who are so fortunate that you know you can testify your husband is a believer. How you need to respect that man and know that this is my own husband and there will be no other brother in the church or outside the church in the place of work or anywhere that will be a substitute for your own husband. That ye, if any obey not the word, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Understand what we are talking about. You are a Christian wife and your husband happens to be an unbeliever. A backslider is not living right. is not obeying the word of God. It says if that man is so hardened that the preaching in the church or the preaching in the cassette or the preaching over the radio or anywhere or literature will not convert him, will not melt his heart, just looking at your behavior, your conduct, your character at home, he will be warned to the Lord without the word. As we are reading this word of God, begin to check up your own family life. If my husband did not come to church, can he see the mark of the message I had in my life that even if he didn't come to church, the impact of that message, the influence of that message, looking at my life will be so much upon him that the word in my life will convert him even though he didn't come to church. 
if my husband is born again but not sanctified, can he just by living with me, looking at my life as a Christian wife, can he be so influenced and be so interested in real sanctification and the deep love of God just by looking at my life? Can that happen? My husband is not prayerful. It's not by argument that my husband will become prayerful. It's not by slotting a cassette uh, over there about prayer, about fasting, when he ought to be resting and sleeping. It's not that that will convert him to be a prayerful man. Can the husband, by looking at your own life, be so moved and motivated and melted to a life of praying that the Spirit of God will draw that man into a life of real a, a prevailing prayer because of your life? And then it says that you'll respect him, you honor him. He'll be looking at your conversation or character that is coupled with fear. The word fear there in verse 2 is not talking of slavish fear. It's not talking of uh, the wife being a slave. Because uh, you are two together, you are joined together, you are one united together. It's talking about honor and reverence and respect for the husband. And the Lord tells us in those two verses that the wives are to be submissive to their own husbands. Obviously then, when we talk of submission, there will be no argument at home. There will be no conflict at home. That the other people in the yard will be saying, these people have started again. If it's a Christian family, we're discussing a very gentle way. We take our decisions very easily because the wife is able to submit to the husband. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You see what, what it says, do it voluntarily, do it cheerfully, do it out of your own volition. You wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the law. It's not after discussions of so many hours. Ah, uh ah, -uh, am I not your husband? What are we discussing? What is it we're arguing about that you cannot submit? Are we not uh, children of God? It says you will submit to your own husbands voluntarily and cheerfully, out of your own volition. In verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. If we're, if we're obedient to these words of God that we're reading, people will not hear our voice outside within the family. Everything will be settled. Our children, they will respect the family, they will respect daddy and mommy because they never see daddy and mommy argue. They know that mommy is uh, submissive to daddy and daddy loves their mommy as a special person. In Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. It's wonderful the way the scripture has arranged everything. It says to love their husbands and then to love their children. Sometimes when Christian women have been praying and fasting, looking for children for a long time, eventually they have the children, their whole attention and their whole affection and their whole love is centered on the children. And they forget the man, they forget the husband. So they give the first place to the children and if there is any remnant of love, they might be able to scatter it on the husband. Do you see what it says? Teach them that they be sober. Then number one, love their husbands. Number two, love their children. In verse five, to be district and chaste, keep us at home good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. In that first Peter where we read it says that while they behold your chaste conversation. Uh, the word conversation there means your manner of life, your character and conduct. But then it uses the word chaste, which means chastity. You are faithful to that man. No other man uh, will see anything of you, feel anything of you, partake anything of you that it belongs to your husband alone. In Ruth chapter 3 from verse 10. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. Inasmuch, listen to this, as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. 
And you may see men that are richer than your husband, you don't follow them. Men that are more educated than your husband, you don't follow them. And you will not internally be meditating and regretting, I, I took my decision too early. If I'd waited a little bit longer, I would have married this other man. If you are doing that, if the Lord sees your heart, you are not totally devoted and faithful to your husband. As we say it for the wife, we're saying it for the husband. You will not see a woman as a Christian husband and say, oh, if, I, if I wasn't in a hurry, I would have uh, maybe been able to marry this one now. Why did I even marry this, my wife? If you are thinking like that and uh, meditating like that, the Lord knows your heart. You are not fully, completely attached to your wife. In Proverbs chapter 31 from verse 10. Proverbs chapter 31 from verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? It's telling us that your wife is a greater, is a more important than riches. Many people do not stand on that today. They do not realize that today that relationship is greater than riches. That the person that you have married is more important than property, is more important than possession. And sometimes it's on the side of the wife too. If a wife has been looking for work and the wife gets work in a far away place, she'll be considering I've been looking for this job for a long time. Uh, the husband should take care of himself because to her, the riches are more important than uh, the, the relationship with her husband. It should not be so. The heart of her husband in verse 11 does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. It is a Christian wife in verse 12. She will do him good, not evil, all the days of her life. In verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom. In her tongue is a law of kindness. If the husband loses the job, in her tongue is the word of kindness. If there is a problem of accommodation, uh, she will not be lashing the husband with words. In her mouth will be the law of kindness. We have difficulty to pay school fees for the children. The woman will not then turn around and become a, a bad woman at home in her mouth. Even though there is no money to pay school fees now, the Lord will provide. If we can pray and agree together, in our tongue will be the law of kindness. We're married and there is no child yet. And then we go for medical tests and the said woman, everything is okay for you. 100%. In fact, if there's anything like 200% perfect, you're all right. The problem will be this man, your husband, he is not complete. And then we get back home in your tongue will still be the law of kindness. You will not say anything to that man that will make him feel less than a human being, less than a fortunate person. It will be a word of encouragement. Now we know what the problem is. The Lord is able to solve the problem for us. In your tongue will be the law of kindness. And then it tells us in verse 30, favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. A woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. What's the consequence of all this? What's the result of if the wife, the Christian wife, is living like the Lord wants her to live? What will be the result? This is the unfailing result. If you honor God with your life as a Christian wife, if you demonstrate the grace of God at home as a Christian wife, if you overlook the present problems and you live in the power of the Lord in the home as a Christian wife, the Lord will be so happy with you. The Lord will want to reward you. He will want to bless you and fulfill the desires of your heart. That's why it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, that they may without the word be warned by the conversation of the wives. That's point number three. We talk about uh, the conversion of the husband through the wife. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Whether thou shalt save thy husband? You are the instrument in the hand of the Lord for the conversion of that husband. It's not only by fasting and praying, by living that loving life, that committed life, that faithful life. Recognizing this man as your own husband, treating him like a king, obeying him as you obey Christ. That even if he's contradicting the word, he's disregarding the word, he's disobeying the word, you still honor him and you are praying for him. 
through your life, transformation will come to your husband. A new change will come to your husband. Peace will come to your family. And if you are the believing husband and your wife is unbelieving, in the second part of that verse 16, How knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? The word of God will not go unfulfilled. The Lord is looking for families who are to perform miracles. The Lord is looking for wives that will so live the life that will be an encouragement to heaven. That heaven will say, because of you, the power that met Saul on the way to Damascus and changed and transformed him because of you. That same power will meet your husband on the way and change your husband in Jesus' name. Whatever spiritual desire you have for your husband, I want my husband to be born again. I want my husband to be sanctified. I want my husband to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want my husband to be an evangelist. I want my husband to be a fervent, effective Christian leader. I want my husband to be a soul winner. I want my husband to have the grace and the power of a missionary. If all that we have been saying and preaching has not made your husband what your husband ought to be, your life, your faithfulness to that husband, and your obedience to the word of God can make your husband what your dreams are thinking about that your husband will be. If God through you can convert your husband and make him a mighty preacher, a mighty warrior, every soul he wins to the Lord, every good thing he does later for the Lord, as the Lord is going to reward him in eternity, the Lord will give you a greater reward. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord to use you for your husband, to use you for your wife, that the life you live, your obedience to the word of God, will so be, be, will be worked out by the Lord, that the Lord himself will take your faithfulness to the world and touch your husband and touch your wife and touch the people around you. The Lord can do it. You pray for yourself first, that your life, your life will be a shining life, will be a bright life, will be a life that is uh, according to the word of God. So that that life will have an effect, an influence, a power, an impact upon your husband, upon your wife. The Lord will do it. He loves you. He loves your family. He knows your desire for your husband. He knows your desire, eagerness for your wife. He is waiting for you. He wants to use you for the conversion of your husband. For the conversion of your wife. Pray and tell the Lord where you have been disregarding the word of God at home. That the Lord himself will help you. So that what needs to be done in your life will be done in your life. And the influence and impact will splash on your husband and your wife. Great things are coming for your family.